Welcome back. Um, there's a device that looks like a Raspberry Pi with a GPU. Um, this is a complicated talk to explain, but I'll let Frank Kelly and Tim explain to you machine learning on the edge. Give them a big hand. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Frank Kelly, and uh, Tim Vivian Griffiths will be helping me out briefly during the presentation. Um, so, I'm actually a data scientist, and I work for a company in, based in the Netherlands uh, called HAL24K, um, and I uh, work on, uh, I guess, any kind of data from the built environment. Ooh. So we're talking about uh, traffic flows, uh, water networks, uh, road condition modeling, and that sort of thing. I also run uh, PyData Bristol. So if anybody uh, happens to live in Bristol or near and wants to drop into our meetup, we're meeting once a month. But anyway, I'm here to talk to you about machine learning on the edge. So what is edge computing? So um, I'm really aiming this talk at data scientists. So a data scientist might say, what's the point of edge computing? I can do all my machine learning in the cloud. Thank you very much. Um, move on. You know, um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the benefits of using Edge as a paradigm. Just as a, a show of hands, how many of you here own a Raspberry Pi? Crikey. Okay, I've come to the right place. And how many people here own a Jetson Nano? So that's one in the audience. That's good. Okay, so I'm telling you something new then. That's good. So. Yeah, as I mentioned, in the cloud we've got Kaggle, we've got Google Colab. You can quickly launch a notebook and start to use a GPU for free, basically. So why would you want to use edge computing? So just to take a step back, what is edge computing for the benefits of people who, who aren't familiar? Given you've all got Raspberry Pis in the room, <laughs> I'm probably uh, yeah, preaching to the converted. I think a good definition is Basically, you're, you're, you're collecting and analyzing the data in the same place that it's actually being generated. Another, another description is uh, any kind of computer program that's delivering sort of lower latency performance um, at, the, at the location of the request being made. Uh, and it's not done remotely in a data center in the cloud. So, some typical situations where edge computing is essential would be where it's not really feasible to connect to the cloud. Uh, there might be very high latency or a kind of limit on the information rent rate being sent from your device. Or possibly you need to make some near real-time decisions and you want your algorithm to give you your recommendation in a very short space of time. And in general, for the most of us, talking about data scientists, it's when you're processing costs in the cloud, whether from transmitting a lot of files backwards and forwards or actually paying for GPU time comes prohibitive. So in industry, certainly this is the way, in the industry I work in, we're very concerned with the smart city and the infrastructure side of things. So what we're seeing is a lot of, um, there's a lot of will to start to install um, these sort of um, industrial internet of things set up. So it's, 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 you could say it's like a series of edge devices that are interconnected and also connected to the cloud. Uh, but it gives you this very fast processing uh, and inference close to the location of where you need to make the decision. So for example, if you're, if you're rerouting traffic, or you're wanting to prevent uh, a flood, something that you need to respond very quickly, this, this is quite ideal. And, and the same thing on a production line, you want to respond quickly to any kind of failure, and you want to optimize your produ production as you go and prevent defects, which can be expensive and involve downtime. Also in the background, edge computing as a concept is on the rise. I guess just being at this conference and seeing the number of children uh, playing with uh, uh, Raspberry Pi devices and so forth, you can see that um, 
I think it's something that's going to continue to grow. Some people have said Edge is the new cloud, and some people are predicting crazy growth rates. Uh, whereas cloud computing as, as a trend is, is, is sort of um, uh, not declining so much, but sort of flattening out, you could say. So my talk is really about why should I try edge computing as a data scientist, um, how to get started and set up with a particular device called the uh, Jetson Nano Developer Kit, uh, some, a machine learning project that I've worked on, and a conclusion about machine, machine learning on the edge uh, versus other uh, paradigms. So machine learning on the edge, what is it exactly? Well, we've all heard of NVIDIA. So they famously work with um, computer graphics cards. Uh, and relatively recently, they've started to produce a series of devices called Jetson. And one of them is, say, the TX2. And behind it is this sort of low cost, but powerful and so-called AI optimized uh, compute resource. And this Jetson TX2 comes in a kit, as, as you can see here with, in the box with the um, power supply and all the things you need. But it's really aimed at sort of the, uh, at, in, at industry really for, for small companies who want to experiment with edge technology. What it really is though, if you think about it, it's a bit of a game changer. Because traditionally, edge computing was where you did quite simple tasks. So you, you might do some basic data aggregation, pre-processing, you're collecting your data, caching it. Whereas it's really in the cloud where anything computationally intensive is taking place. So what this Jetson series of devices means is suddenly you can actually apply machine learning at the edge, which which means edge computing is, in theory, gaining a bit of territory uh, versus cloud in that sense. So how to get into edge-based edge, edge machine learning as a data scientist? Well, we might have a few inbuilt fears. Um, we not, might not be amazing on the command line. We might not be DevOps pros. Uh, we might be kind of afraid of having to move away from Python and other familiar languages such as R. Uh, also, the idea of having to learn about electronics and soldering and masses of cables may be scary. Maybe less so after seeing lots of very young people <laughs> managing to do it amazingly well yesterday. Um, but in general, we're quite comfortable in the cloud. And we may, a lot of us might think it might be some kind of frustrating experience, best avoided. So I'm going to tell you otherwise. So the Jetson Nano has been touted as democratizing and disrupting edge machine learning. If anybody can spot the mistake on, on the slide, that's not a Jetson Nano. That's a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> that's a Jetson Nano. So you can see the difference. There's this huge heat sink on the top. And it's a similar order of price to some Raspberry Pis. I think a Raspberry Pi Zero is much cheaper. But $99, so depending on what happens with our government at the moment, around 95 pounds. So it's quite a reasonable price. Uh, but it's effectively a Raspberry Pi with a GPU, in simple terms. Uh, so all of the usual things you can expect with a modern Raspberry Pi are on board. Tuning HDMI output, display port, um, Raspberry Pi camera connector, gigabit ethernet and, and the rest of it, plus GPU, but minus Wi-Fi. For some reason, they didn't bother including Wi-Fi chip on board. Performance-wise, this is the difference. So against these, I don't know, I don't know too much about Raspberry Pi. I don't know if these are the latest and greatest. But it's, it's a huge difference if you're wanting to, to, to do anything that's computationally intensive in this area. So I've actually brought one along. Um, Tim, were you going to help me set it up? Very yeah, briefly. Just need to log, just in. Need to log in. Do you want to put this? Do you want 
Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's okay. Switch. Is this going to work? I'm going to switch over the HDMI. Ooh. Oh, you switch. Oh, okay. You want that to come up on the screen? Uh, yes, of course. Right. No. Is this going directly from there into the monitor, though? At the moment, yeah. Right, okay. I think you said it's going to be mirrored. It's going to be mirrored, is it? Okay. I think I'll just carry on with the presentation because it's just taking a while to set up there, so apologies for that short intermission. <laughs> Problem with doing a live demo, right? So if, if you want to start to use this sort of device, um, it's really aimed at machine learning applications, so, um, but it's not... It's not, um, it's not ideal for training machine learning models. So if any of you are data scientists, you know that um, the bulk of computational power is uh, relating to uh, the training exercise. Um, you okay? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. So Tim's just setting up the Jetson now to do a sort of demo. So, so it's really about doing inference. So. Ideally, there's sort of two approaches. You can either take an existing machine learning application that you've built and run it on this device with sort of minimal modifications, or you can actually build up from scratch your own sort of machine learning uh, inference platform that you can run from home. How are you getting on, Tim? It's tilde Jetson inference, and then... Uh, sorry, Tilda Projects, Jetson Inference. It's... There's Tilda Projects, Jetson Inference. Thank you. So build and then AA, build slash AAR, I think, and then a bin, I think, and then, and then you've got all of the, you can launch the, um, the ImageNet camera. It should be a previous command there. Thank you. So that should run it, yeah. So, so this is, uh, so out of the box, uh, you just get um, uh, a very basic device. So you need to, you need to buy an ethernet cable, um, a power supply, um, and a minimum 16 gigabyte uh, micro SD card. So this is uh, a Raspberry Pi camera plugged in, straight off the bat. And we're gonna demonstrate uh, the, some inference on the fly. So if we get, Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll do the keyboard, yeah. Need the keyboard? Yeah, I want to try the... Random toy. Caldera. Oh, no, I think it's, it's still picking up the keyboard. If you move that, does it pick up the, the elephant? Maybe not. 
I'll tell you that. <laughs> Some brass. Some <laughs> so there you go. At some point in its training, it had something that it thought that was a brand. Yeah. And then we've got the PG Tips Monkey. PG Tips Monkey. Woolen. I'll tell you about it. There we go. So um, thank you for that, Tim. Uh, can everyone give a round of applause to my assistant, Tim? Pedestrian detection. That's not good. If, if you want to do it at the end, maybe. Okay. Should we go for that? Yeah, if you want to set it up. Can I switch the screen, screens over? Thank you. So I'll skip forwards a bit. Um, yeah, just, just saying what you have to do when you set up. You need to flash a micro SD card, which is under the heat sink. You can load up Ubuntu. You're going to have to buy some additional components, so it's not just £95. You end up buying a cooling fan. Uh, because the heatsink gets very hot, as you can imagine. Uh, you, you're going to buy, if you're doing a home project, you're going to buy a load of sensors, and you might want to shell out on a Raspberry Pi camera. So I've included one here. Uh, and you probably want to upgrade your micro SD to about 64 gigabytes to be sensible. Uh, so setting up standard stuff, install Git, and a few um, packages. As the previous talk was alluding to, make use of virtual environments. Virtual end prepper is nice. Uh, you, can, you can install um, all the deep learning libraries that you're familiar with as a data scientist, these Python-based deep learning frameworks. They're all supported on the Jetson Nano. Uh, and as we saw, you can try out the camera. And that's what it looks like close up. Uh, so you can't install just the standard version of TensorFlow. You need to download a, an NVIDIA version of TensorFlow. Um, you need to build NumPy, but you can install SciPy and Keras. It's all standard stuff. So I'm going to talk about a machine learning project on the Jetson Nano developer kit. I think that air pollution is a major topic. Um, they say in 2008 it contributed to 30,000 deaths or so. Uh, and, and apparently if air, air pollution was solved, it would have a bigger impact than, say, removing passive smoking or road traffic incidents. So starting out with my project, I just want to see if I can predict air quality very, very localized outside my house in the next hour or so, um, and both inside and outside the house to get an understanding of if, how well insulated my house is, in a way. <laughs> so to start this off, I need a load of sensors. Um, one thing I learned about very quickly is that one of these Internet of Things uh, nodes is, is worth getting hold of. It's called a node MCU. Uh, anybody in the audience familiar with one of these? Yeah, a couple. It's, so what it's doing is it sits in between your, your sensors and where you're processing the data from your sensors. And it, and it just quietly sits there and gathers all the data. Um, and it can send it off to a, a database. Uh, so you're switching now from an edge computing framework to something called a FOG framework, which is a combination of edge devices and cloud-based processing. To set this up, uh, it's a little bit tricky, but you have to write in a language called Lua, and you have to um, set up some configuration files. But in the same way that you flash your Jetson Nano or your Raspberry Pi, you can flash this device, and it'll do some kind of low-level processing and data collection tasks, which is very handy, because if, you're, if you want to use your Jetson Nano for something else, um, like inference at a conference talk, for example, then you want to leave this at home, ticking away, collecting all your data for you. And this device costs 10, probably under 10 pounds, I imagine. So for this project, I also needed another bunch of sensors, so I picked up um, a CO2 and NOx um, sensor. It's a bit tricky to calibrate. You have to leave it running for 24 hours to try and get the sort of the base level in clean air, and then and after that you can calibrate it. It's calculating parts per million of whichever gas you require. There's another one that's looking at temperature, humidity, uh, because air quality is kind of related to the weather as well. So you want to monitor those. 
And this device on the right is a PM2.5, PM10 uh, sensor. So it's drawing in air and it's using um, uh, lasers to count the number of particles and see how um, bad the air is around. So this connects to your node MCU. Just be careful you get the right pins connected. Uh, if anything starts smoking, it's probably a bad sign, <laughs> in my experience. Uh, and as an aside, if you want to build your own air quality sensor and have the data sent to, a, uh, to be part of this air pollution map, then you should check out luftdaten.no. It's a German website. As you can see, it's mainly focused over in the continent. But we're starting to build up a few um, sensor points in the UK. There's not too many in Wales yet, so um, I recommend you give that a go. Uh, as soon as you've got your data, though, you, you want to send it somewhere. So I've started using InfluxDB. So it's really nice for um, ingesting time series data. It's a distributed database with SQL-like queries. So it's very easy to get up and going with it if you're familiar with SQL. And there's two ways to get data into the database. You either pull your, um, uh, your node device that I described, or you uh, push data directly to your database from the node device. Oh, my computer's now loading. What does that mean? Parts of this slide didn't load. OK, so the next step is really to uh, train your model. So I suggest you make use of something such as Paperspace. So this is a cloud-based machine learning service. and. This, this is the sort of sequence you have to go through. So you set up uh, a specific N NVIDIA uh, virtual machine, uh, and you, you create a container in Docker, and you spin up a sort of high-spec uh, multi-GPU instance, and you launch, launch your model training. So in the case of me trying to predict air quality, I might want to set up uh, an LSTM, for example. So um, a recurrent neural network that's, that's taking multi-channel inputs and predicting how my uh, air quality is going to be in the next two hours. So you train this model on a lot of historical data. Make sure you don't leave this running um, over the weekend or something, because it can start to be expensive. Uh, once your model is trained, you can then create something called an NVIDIA Tensor RT model. You can send this over to your Jetson Nano, and then you can perform inference and work this in real time on your fresh data as you go in. So there you've got your, oops. My slide did not, did not like this slide. Uh -huh. It's weird. It's like uh, it's run out of memory or something on my machine. Uh, so that was a diagram of the whole setup, which would have been really nice. Um, maybe if I come out. Yeah, there you go. So, so what you've got is it's a combination of um, uh, edge devices. Uh, and a bit of uh, cloud going on, and also, uh, so, so it's generally sort of a, you could call it fog computing I've created, basically. I haven't actually done the, I have to admit, I haven't done the, um, the, the training of the model as yet. I'm still collecting enough sensor data to do something sensible, but that's my next step. So the next version of this talk I do, I'll, I'll be showing some results. That's the plan. So. In general, you can do um, transfer learning. So if you want to bring in a model that somebody else has trained, so um, for example, Google ImageNet, as we were showing off earlier, you can load it onto your, um, into your cloud space. You can, you, can, you can unfreeze a couple of layers, and you can train that model for your particular application. Like if you wanted to, I don't know, identify people in the PyCon conference, for example, you could train uh, ImageNet as a base, train a few layers, and then you'd create a new model, and you could load that onto your Jetson Nano and perform inference. Uh, so I'm just going to round off here. So considering the different paradigms, each one has pros and cons. And one I haven't mentioned is to just to, to on-site computing options. So this would be just go and buy a really high-spec uh, GPU machine in, to have in your house. Uh, the thing is, you're always going to be limited by whichever spec machine you bought. 
and it's a, it's a, it's a high one-off cost. Um, whereas edge computing, it's nice because it's a low-cost device. Uh, you remove the you remove the latency issues, um, but the th then again, it's slow for training. So I really think the bottom right is the way to go. So you you use the cloud briefly to train your model, but then you're you're doing all your inference at the edge. Uh, so overall, you're keeping your, your running costs going down for your project. But the thing is, you create this complex system that I showed earlier. I can actually present the slide now. Um, so again, the ideal scenario for me is like a foggy scenario. Um, and that's what I'm working with at the moment. And there it is. Uh, so in summary, edge computing, powerful concept. Expect to see a lot more of, uh, of this. Uh, GPU inference is now possible. One day, maybe we'll be able to train models at the edge as well. Uh, if, you want to, if you're a data scientist and you've been avoiding Raspberry Pis for now, then this could be the excuse to get into this um, kit-based stuff. If children can do it, then you can probably do it, I think. Um, and there's plenty of resources, thanks to the Raspberry Pi community, that you can piggyback off and, and borrow. And here are some useful references if you want to jump into it. But that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Lunch is served, but if, you, if there's any question, I will accept just the one. Yeah? <clears throat> well, maybe more if you want to stay. Hello. Really Hi. great talk. I never believed that we'll get a GPU on the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> now, the training bit, I was thinking maybe not only transfer learning, but reinforcement learning. How do you believe we could do reinforcement learning to try an online model all the time on the GPU? Training should be a little easier, maybe. What's your opinion? Yes, um, reinforcement learning, that was your question. Um, I think it would be ideal if it was possible to train a model um, at the edge uh, using reinforcement learning, because in reinforcement learning, you, you're, the, the output has an impact on the environment, which then feeds back into how your model is, is penalized or rewarded. So yeah, that would be, I think, a fantastic um, thing if it existed. But at the moment, I don't think the processing power is quite there. But um, yeah, that's something that they should aim for, I think. Yes. <laughs> One more question? No, or thanks, Frank. <laughs>